This edition of Mac Voices is supported by Take Control Books, the answers you need now from leading experts. Visit TakeControlBooks.com to find out what you can learn. And by Mac Voices Magazine, our free Flipboard magazine that brings you some of the best Mac, iPhone, and iPad productivity tips on the web. High in signal, low in noise, just like Mac Voices, Mac Voices Magazine includes information on how you can get more out of your Apple technology. Subscribe at macvoices.com slash magazine or search for Mac Voices Magazine on Flipboard. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is a talk of the Mac community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, the road to Mac stock is uh, being well-traveled recently. It seems like we're having the chance to talk to a lot of different uh, speakers and, and presenters in a row. This time, though, I'm happy to welcome somebody brand new to Mac Voices, Allison Hartley. She's going to be a speaker at Mac stock, and I'm very, very anxious to get to know her. Allison, it's great to see you. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Well, that's good. That's good. So... Introduce yourself to our audience uh, for those who may not know of your podcast or what you do. Sure. I am a podcaster. I do. I host the uh, Tech Doctor podcast along with my dear friend, Robert Carter. Um, we are at dr-carter.com, and we are a very Apple-centric podcast, uh, mainly aimed at the blind and visually impaired uh, Mac and iOS using community. But I like to think that we have something there for everybody. We talk a lot um, about resources that various people put out um, regarding how to use the Mac and iOS. You've had our friend Shelly Brisbane on your show a couple of times. Um, we talk about apps, um, which by accident or design happen to be accessible to those of us who use the Mac and iOS. Um, we occasionally do a deep dive into apps uh, like LaunchBar. Um, and we just generally have a good time. We do coverage um, of every Apple event after the fact. Um, we analyze both from a mainstream and an accessibility perspective um, what comes out of all of the events. So uh, it's a really uh, it's a fun podcast. We tend to podcast um, more when we have something to say rather than sticking to a set schedule. Um, so if you're all interested, please do check it out. So so Robert is your partner. Yes. Wow. And he will also be he will also be presenting at MaxDog. Yeah, man, that's that's not good. He's nothing but trouble. I know. He's nothing but trouble. <laughs> I don't know how I've put up with him for this long. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Robert's been on on Mac Voices as well, and yes. uh, he's he's a good guy. I met him last he year is. at MaxDoc, and it's it's a pleasure to get to know him. And I, I I always look at podcasts like yours as extremely valuable uh, for for your particular audience. But not just for your particular audience, for the rest of us as well, because it seems like more and more accessibility is becoming something that is going mainstream because it adds capabilities to the the OS that a lot of us might need, even though we might not classify ourselves as needing accessibility. Right. I always I always say that accessibility is not just for people with disabilities. Accessibility is for everybody. Um, when my friend at work, uh, I work for a state agency as a rehabilitation counselor. I help other blind people to find jobs and to live more independently. That's my day job. So my friend at work came up to me the other day and said, Allison, I want to be able to read books on my phone without looking at it because I have, um, I drive a lot in the car and I want to be able to just read an iBook that I'm, that I'm looking at uh, without actually having to see the screen. And I said, oh, come here, let me show you something. Um, and I showed her a feature on the iPhone called Speak Screen, which when you have it turned on, you swipe down with two fingers from the top of the iPhone and it actually begins to play as though it's an audio file, um, whatever text uh, is on the screen at the time. So in her case, it was an iBook and it has player controls so you can uh, stop and rewind and fast forward and change the speed. Um, and she just, it kind of, I could almost see the light bulb going off in her head because she was like, wow, <laughs> so this just isn't, this isn't just for, for you. It's really for me and for everybody. And I'm like, exactly. Accessibility is for everybody. Uh, perfect example, excellent example. I know there. I open the accessibility panels on my iPhone, iPad, Mac, and I find things there that's like, wow. So that's how you do it. But I would mm -hmm. not have necessarily thought about looking in accessibility. So it's it's a it's a treasure trove of capabilities. You just have to kind of remind yourself to go and look there. 
yeah, just go in and play around and, and see what it can do. Chances are you'll find something that will that will help you. Absolutely. So we're here primarily to talk about Mac stock. Um, I know I don't believe you were there last year. I was supposed to be there last year. Ah. Um, the night the night before we were, I was set to fly out. My husband, um, who had been struggling with some health issues that we hadn't quite been able to diagnose, um, got a call from the doctor after a chest X-ray that said, "Come into the emergency room right now. Um, we need to see you. There's something wrong." And um, it turned out that he was diagnosed uh, with kidney disease. Um, and a year on, he is uh, responding very well to dialysis treatment, um, and he's on the waiting list uh, for a kidney transplant. But um, at that time, we just we weren't sure if it was his heart. We weren't sure if it was his kidney. We weren't sure if it was something that was immediately life threatening. And it, it would have been had we not um, gotten it addressed right then. But of course, at that time, I was in the hospital with him uh, when Max Talk was was happening last year. But he is coming uh, as as my guest um, this year, so everyone will get to get to meet him. And uh, he's a great guy. So. Um, I'm glad he's better. <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely. Well, it's, it's it's a shame that, of course, it had to hit right then. But I'm so glad to hear that the story has a happy ending. Oh, thank you. We like happy endings. Yes. Seems like we don't get many of them anymore, but I, we definitely like them. Yeah. So what what is your topic going to be? Well, my presentation is called uh, "My iPhone Ate My Mac: uh, Productivity and and Accessibility in an Increasingly Mobile World." Try saying that one five times fast. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the purpose of the presentation, um, I will be going over um, the accessibility features of, of the iPhone. I will be focusing really almost exclusively on, on VoiceOver, the built-in screen reader, uh, due to time constraints. But the, the purpose of the presentation is not only to, to talk about this feature known as VoiceOver, which makes the iPhone uh, much more than just a piece of non-speaking glass to me. Um, it makes it something that I can use. Um, it makes it something that has become, in a lot of ways, a computer replacement for me. Right now, I'm on my Mac uh, because of the superior camera quality, um, I would assume, of the of the camera on, on the Mac. But um, in many ways, my iPhone has become my primary computing device um, as you know, for everything that I do at home. And so the purpose of the presentation is to talk more in depth about that, to talk about some of the apps that I use, um, not only uh, mainstream stream apps like Twitterific, for example, but also um, some apps that have been developed specifically for people who are blind or visually impaired, um, which have in many ways taken the place of um, various pieces of other more expensive hardware that I would have otherwise used. For example, I have a app, a ten dollar app on my phone that I can hold my camera up to a uh, uh, money and it will tell me what the bill is. Um, I used to have to use a $100 uh, piece of equipment to do that. So the iPhone um, has just revolutionized the way I do pretty much everything. And that, that will be mainly what my, what my presentation will focus on. That's going to be a fascinating topic. There seems to be such a desire, and, and frankly, at times I don't understand it, to replace one device with the other device. At times, just for the sake of replacing it. But when it's a superior experience or su superior performance for what you're trying to do, then I'm, I'm absolutely all for it. And it sounds like that's what the iPhone has become for you. Yes, very much so. Particularly um, with iOS 9, they have squashed a lot of the more uh, pesky bugs um, that plagued not only voiceover users, but, but everybody who uses the iPhone. Um, you're right that you don't want to just replace for the sake of replacing. Um, but when the user experience offered is, is so superior, then it just makes sense to have one device for everything, um, especially with things like Do Not Disturb. You know, at night I can turn on Do Not Disturb, I can have my book going, and I can just have this one little device rather than having my phone and a, and a specialized MP3 player or, or even a Kindle. Um, I've been playing with the, with the new Kindles a little bit. Um, and it was nice to have a, a dedicated device for reading books, but I found that the user experience in terms of, in terms of the voice quality of reading books on the phone um, and in terms of the gestures that were used for, for voiceover users was, uh, was far superior to the, um, to the screen reader on the Kindles. Hmm. I, recognizing that you're visually impaired, this may be 
a questionable question, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, you've, you're focusing on the iPhone. Do you mm -hmm. find any benefit or, or is, it, is the, the fact that there is an iPad out there just not really, it doesn't add anything to your experience? Um, I have an iPad and when there were more iPad exclusive apps uh, that did more, like for example, the New York Times app um, tended to do more when you used the iPad app, there was more video content available. Um, then I found myself wanting to, uh, to use it more. Um, there were certain iBooks that were iPad only. Um, and so I bought the iPad primarily to, to do that, to use those types of apps and books. But um, with the introduction of the larger phones, um, a lot of that has gone away. And now I'm finding that I can use um, the features um, of, of the iPad and the books that used to only be able to be read on the iPad on my phone um, and have the superior battery life that used to be afforded to me only by the iPad. And so I gave it to my husband and he's also blind, but he uses it for his work and accessibility testing. Um, and I don't miss it. I, I certainly, um, in some ways, I actually found the bigger screen to be helpful because when you're getting the idea as a person who is totally blind like me um, of the layout of a web page, for example, it is very nice to have that big screen to really look um, at where the element of the web page is under your finger. So that was very cool. But just in terms of sheer portability, I find that my 6S Plus um, at this point really meets all my needs. Hmm. I never really thought about the fact that there are, because I've experienced it too, that there are certain websites that modify their content a bit for the, the iPhone. Uh, mm -hmm. Or at least they, they used to. And your point is very well taken. With the larger phones, you don't run into those limitations anywhere near as much. Right. It's just, it's been the 6S Plus, especially um, in terms of being able to access all the content I want and being able to. Um, being able to have the superior battery life has just has, has changed everything for me. You know, I use my phone pretty much all day, every day when I'm at home, and I maybe only have to charge it once a day. So this is going to be a really interesting uh, presentation, I think, for everyone. Uh, it, it will educate us how users like yourself interact with this technology. But you've already taught me something that I really hadn't thought about, is it the, the, the iPhone versus the iPad battery life being a bigger thing, but also why a visually impaired user would want a larger iPhone. It, it makes perfect sense. I just hadn't thought about it. Right. Especially somebody who might have uh, more vision um, might still find that they benefit from both devices because sometimes folks um, with some vision who benefit from magnification might be able to read um, more on the iPad. Um, they might be able to do some spot reading with the iPhone, but the screen might still be a little bit small, even on the plus models. But yeah, there is there is definitely a place a place for both for a lot of people. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. Um, so I'm curious, you, you touched on this a little bit, but where do you spend your productivity time? Not, not reading uh, books or whatever, but what apps do you spend your productivity time in? Um, in terms of podcasting, and this is where I'm hoping to make uh, some changes with my new microphone setup. In terms of podcasting, I do still find that I'm that I'm using my Mac uh, for things like recording and audio editing. Um, I'm a big fan of Amadeus Pro, but there are some apps, uh, Boss Jock Studio and um, Fairlight Recording Studio. Uh, for the phone, which are accessible and which have, in some cases, some Bluetooth keyboard shortcuts built in um, to make things like editing uh, a little bit more feasible on those devices. In terms of productivity, I am a heavy Twitter user. Um, I use Twitterific. I'm privileged enough to be on the beta team. Um, and they have really made strides um, in recent years to make Twitterific the most accessible app uh, not only for sighted users, but for voiceover users as well. Um, I can, if somebody has a Twitter client like Twitterific or the official Twitter app that supports um, the al alternative text, um, when you upload a picture, you can, with supported clients, you can include alternative text descriptions for users who are blind or visually impaired. Um, with Twitterific, I have not only the ability 
to read those alternative text, text descriptions, but I also have the ability to um, add them myself if I were to post a picture. So that's kind of awesome. I, I use Twitterific a lot on the on the iPhone. I use drafts um, for capturing notes. If I wanted to do more complex documents with that, I could uh, using Markdown. Um, I have pages for if I should need to write a document. Um, I don't find myself doing a whole lot of document creation at home. I do it more um, at work where I am still unfortunately tied to Windows. Um, but even that is supposedly going to be changing. Apparently we'll be able to use more iPhones and iPads at work at some point. It's the state, so the wheels of government turn very slowly. Um, I use... Um, an app called Tap Tap C a lot um, to take pictures of items and find out what they are. Um, the other day, I washed a bunch of socks and realized my black socks and my white socks feel exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> so I used Tap Tap C to take pictures pretty quickly of all of the socks and was able to match them. It, it said, you know, white white dress sock, uh, black dress sock, um, and that level of freedom um, really can only come uh, from an, uh, a piece of equipment like the iPhone. There are, you know, specialized barcode readers uh, for us that, that will read the barcodes for things like cans of food and what have you. But for something quick like taking a picture of a sock and finding out what color it is, you can't, you can't beat the, the iPhone with something like Tap Tap C. Um, but yeah, I, I'm realizing as I'm thinking um, of the productivity type apps that I use, just how just how active I am on Twitter. <laughs> I'm a little ashamed of how much time I spend on Twitter now. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, I mean, it, it's fascinating that, the, the, and I love the way you're defining productivity uh, because you're you're stre you're stretching the definitions of productivity beyond what a lot of us would think of. Um, because productivity, excuse me, Twitter f for you is a productivity tool. Yes, it's how it's how I keep up on things like Apple News. Um, I follow uh, a lot of the major Apple accounts. I do have a, an, a couple of RSS readers um, on my phone that I can quickly look at articles. But I get I get a lot of my news from Twitter. Um, I use a breaking news app, um, which sometimes is a little bit too chatty. Um, of course, I use you know Mail dot app. Um, to, to manage all of my email. I, I go on Facebook a little bit. I'm not really, not really as into Facebook. Twitter is really more of my, my social network of choice. So let's turn it on its head. Um, though you, cause everything I think I've heard you say is pretty much iOS based. What mm -hmm. do you still have on your Mac that you just haven't found the, the right, the right parity with for iOS, a decent replacement or uh, an app that you wish would do better on iOS? Um, because of the limitations with core audio on iOS, I have not found a way of recording Skype calls. Um, and once I figure out a way to do that, I don't know how much I'll use the Mac anymore, to be completely honest with you. Um, I use Audio Hijack to record uh, my Skype calls when Robert and I are recording the podcast. Um, and I use Amadeus Pro for editing. I want to really check out Boss Jock, uh, like I was telling you before we started recording, I, I bought it and then I forgot about it <laughs> because I realized um, that there were a lot of limitations surrounding the recording of Skype calls. Um, apparently, there, there are some apps and some ways in which that is changing um, because I know some of the mainstream podcasts I've been listening to, some folks have been able to record Skype on the iPad Pro. I will have to go back and figure out what apps those are so that I can figure out if I can do it on my phone as well. Um, but that's, you know, that is the, the main thing I really find myself using my, um, my Mac for at this point is my podcasting. Interesting. So your iPhone really has eaten your Mac. It has. <laughs> that's, that's cool. That's cool. This, I, I, I love this because you, again, you're, uh, you're making me aware of things that I wouldn't have. You've probably heard us talk a lot on Mac voices about, you know, let's not replace just for the sake of replacing. But again, it sounds like you are having a superior exper experience in iOS um, and really don't need some of the things that the Mac offers at this point because they don't apply to you. Right. I am all about um, using the right tools for the job. And when I, when I talk to my clients um, who I help prepare for employment, I, I, I emphasize that for them. And I say, you know, 
technology is a tool. So whatever tool helps you to accomplish the job most effectively in your work environment is what you have to use. Um, for my work environment right now, I'm still stuck on Windows. But again, as, as iOS devices um, are introduced into my particular work environment, I foresee, um, obviously with a Bluetooth keyboard for prolonged uh, document writing, I foresee iOS uh, becoming a more uh, prominent part of my work life as well. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. The, uh, the the right tool for the right job. As frustrated as yeah. I can get with Windows at times, there are still things that only are Windows specific, and so you have to work in that environment. Um, but hopefully, that is changing as we move to the cloud, and and we see the proliferation of iOS devices and and things advance in that area too. So. Right, and as developers um, become more aware. Um, of accessibility. There is um, a MUD client. Um, I play a lot of multi-user dungeon games called MUDs. Um, and there's a MUD client for Windows and there uh, is that I use called VIP MUD. There's another one for, for uh, iOS called MUD Rammer. Unfortunately, there is not an accessible MUD client for Mac just yet. But the developer of MUD Rammer for iOS um, is extremely aware of, of voiceover users um, and the fact that we enjoyed these games and has really made great strides to build accessibility um, from the ground up into into his client uh, to the point where there are a lot of different uh, Bluetooth keyboard shortcuts that you can use um, you can do triggers it's really it's really kind of amazing um, and that's where I really feel um, that I am meant to help uh, educate developers um, about accessibility um, accessibility doesn't always mean specific to uh, those of us who are blind or visually impaired, it doesn't mean always developing a special app, although there are certainly specific apps for us that help me on a day-to-day -day basis. But accessibility, developing an accessible app means developing an app that everybody can use because I use my phone by and large uh, the same way that you and, and most of our viewers do. Um, I just use different features of it sometimes. Hmm. I, 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 do you feel like the, the developers in the past, say, three to five years have become a lot more aware of accessibility? I, I seem to, I feel like it comes up more in the discussions I have with developers, uh, whereas once it was one or two, you might hear something, but now if they're not super aware of it, at least, at least they're aware of it and have it on their agendas to address. I do feel that it has become much more prominent, uh, particularly since I have begun using iOS devices. Um, oftentimes when I encounter an app which is not as voiceover accessible, um, and just as a side note, it's very easy to make your apps uh, voiceover accessible if you use the standard controls which Apple implements. Um, when I encounter an app which is not accessible, I write to developers. Um, and most of the time I have a really great conversation. Um, oftentimes it gives me an opportunity to be a part of the beta team and contribute um, ideas and my experiences as a voiceover user to making the app more accessible in subsequent updates. But when I first started um, advocating on a one-on-one -on -one basis with developers, um, sometimes I would hear, oh, well, I just don't know how to do this. And so we don't really have any plans to incorporate accessibility. Um, and I found that a lot of times, a lot of those apps just didn't stick around. Um, because if you're a developer um, who, through a simple lack of knowledge of accessibility, um, doesn't incorporate it into the first run through, I feel like if you're a developer who cares about user experience, once you are made aware um, of the resources of which are available to developers to make something accessible, um, a person who cares about good, smart design um, will learn what is needed to make apps accessible. And I find that that has happened a lot more in the past several years that my, my um, conversations with developers, which may also be a combination of my, you know, honing my own skills in advocacy, um, have been ex extremely positive in terms of helping them to, uh, to develop apps and updates, which are more accessible. Um, there's a wonderful website, um, which I encourage any app developer who has questions or concerns about the accessibility of an app, whether it's already out or upcoming, it's applevis.com, A-P-P-L-E-V as in Victor, I-S.com. It is a community of 
um, individuals who are blind or visually impaired. And the, the site strives to um, highlight apps which are accessible and not so much. Um, it has a, There's a podcast uh, which has demos of different apps and uh, different features like uh, using uh, voiceover with a braille display, for example. Um, and it is a, f a forum for uh, developers to dialogue with many members of the blind and visually impaired um, Apple using community all at once um, to gain testers, to gain insight on how we use the devices that we use. Um, it's a great way to, uh, to get in contact and to get questions answered. And to take this full circle, I think it also helps that People are becoming developers, in particular, are becoming more and more aware of the, the functions that are being categorized as accessibility, and realizing that there are things built in that they can take advantage of, not just for the accessibility community, but for everyone to have a better experience, no matter what their needs. Exactly. I mean, there are um, people in my own life who do not have any real degree of visual impairment, but they use, for example, the, the zoom features, um, to make text bigger when, um, they might be in a, in a dark environment or an environment where they can't see the screen as well. Um, accessibility, as I've said, is, is really, is really for everybody. It's, it's for you. It's for me. It's for, um, the guy down the street who may not have any disabilities. It's, uh, it's, it's, really it's universal it's accessibility is usability yeah there you go there you go we need a t-shirt with that that's good that's <laughs> good <laughs> well i'm looking forward to meeting you in uh in in chicago i keep saying chicago and then prefacing it by saying it's really woodstock illinois but it's just outside chicago so for all intents and purposes um it will be Chicago in July. Uh, I'm, I'll be anxious to meet your husband, too. Um, I'm so glad that he's able to make the trip with you and that things are working out there. Thank you. Me, too. It's going to be a blast. I'm looking forward to meeting you as well. So one more time, tell everybody where they can where they can find you and especially, you know, your your prolific Twitter presence. Yes. Um, the, the best and quickest way to get a hold of me um, is to follow me on Twitter. I am at Apple Alley, A-P-P-L-E. A L L I. Feel free to reach out. Great, and the and again the website for the uh, the podcast is the website for the podcast is dr carter c a r t e r dot com. That's the Tech Doctor podcast. Excellent, excellent, Allison. It's been a real pleasure. I, again, I look forward to meeting you, and uh, we'll have some fun in Chicago. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. We want to see you in Chicago, too. If you haven't planned to come to MacStock yet, do so now. There's still tickets available. There's still plenty of time to, to book your flights and make book your hotels and join us because it's going to be a lot of fun and a lot of education as well. Until the next time, and as always, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the Mac Voices blog. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date on all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Do more with your Apple tech by subscribing to the free Mac Voices magazine on Flipboard by visiting macvoices.com slash magazine. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.